listen to? I don't know. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the, uh, this afternoon's session, uh, which is uh, 1914, remembering the First World War. Um, I'm not sure whether it's only 1914. The war rolled on for four years, but uh, we'll be uh, back. yeah, we'll be back. Um, uh, now, uh, as all of you are aware, this year marks the centenary of uh, uh, a conflict that had a profound impact on uh, modern world history and uh, it's variously known as the Great War for Civilization. At, uh, optimistically, it is also referred to as the War to End All Wars. And uh, the state that I come from, uh, in undivided Punjab, till today I think uh, it's known as uh, uh, the Lam, the Long War. Uh, and I think to illustrate that, one of the reasons for that is my, my own grandfather's regiment sailed from India in uh, September 1914 and they did not return till um, August 1921, um, which just gives you an indication of uh, uh, the kind of impact uh, that uh, the war had, uh, particularly on the Punjab, which provided over 60% of uh, uh, Indian manpower uh, in that particular conflict. Um, uh, on a global scale, of course, the, the war, you know, it impacted uh, people and countries at various, various levels. It, it's resulted in the end of, of four empires, uh, the, the, Ger the Germans, the Austro-Hungarians, uh, the Turks, and uh, the Russians. Um, all, all those empires vanished. And uh, uh, the impact of the war is, is actually felt um, in some of uh, the modern day conflicts, particularly in the Middle East uh, till today. I'm very glad that we have a um, a very interesting panel to, to talk about uh, the war and its memory. Uh, I must uh, give you a bit of a background of how this panel came about, actually. In, it was initially, when we, we spoke about this panel, it was intended to be to focus on uh, India and the Great War. Uh, because, and we'll come to that later, uh, while in many parts of the world there is um, what could be called a surfeit or an excess of memory. Uh, in India, for a number of reasons, there is almost uh, no memory of World War I, and I'm talking about this on an official level. And why that is there is, is part of what we will be talking about a little later. Um, but it's not that India didn't have uh, or did not contribute uh, in significant terms to the war effort. It, Indian contribution was very significant indeed. Uh, we had more than 1.5 million men that served overseas uh, during the war. Almost, uh, I think, 70,000 of them uh, did not return to Indian shores. Uh, Indian soldiers fought uh, in uh, Gallipoli, in France, Belgium, uh, East Africa, Mesopotamia, in uh, Iran, and, uh, of course, on the northwest frontier. Uh, Salonika, uh, and I'm sure there are a couple of other uh, theaters that I missed out. In, uh, uh, in terms of equipment in stores, uh, India contributed over 80 million pounds worth. And this is a, a statistic that I'm quoting from uh, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. And just to put that in perspective, 100 pounds in 1917 would have been equivalent to 34,000 pounds today. Mm -hmm. Uh, so 80 million pounds uh, was a lot of money. But that wasn't the only contribution. Uh, India also contributed in uh, direct uh, uh, monetary contribution from its revenues uh, till 1920, the sum of 142 million pounds. So uh, India had a very significant role to play in that conflict. Um, but of course, it was a global conflict. And um, we're here to talk about how the war is uh, remembered on global levels and, of course, various other aspects uh, of that conflict. Uh, we have uh, today um, on this panel um, uh, Peter Stanley, who's a, a professor at the University of New South Wales in Canberra at the Australian Defence Force Academy. And uh, Peter writes about people in extreme situations, war, protest, surgery, bushfire, and he's one of Australia's most distinguished military social historians. He's published over 25 books and 
uh, his latest Bad Characters, which was awarded the uh, Australian Prime Minister's Prize for Australian History in 2011. Um, we also have uh, Maya Jasinov, who's a professor of history at Harvard and an author of prize-winning works about the British Empire, including Edge of Empire and Liberty's Exiles. Uh, the latter won the 2012 National Book Critics Circle Award for Nonfiction, uh, the George Washington Book Prize, and was shortlisted for the Samuel Johnson Prize. And she's currently writing a book about the novelist Joseph Conrad and his times. And then we have uh, Jeff Dyer. Jeff lives in London. He's the author of four novels, and most recently, Jeff in Venice. Uh, six uh, genre-defying titles, most recently, Zona, which is about Andrei uh, Tarkovsky, uh, Tarkovsky's film, Stalker, and two collections of essays, Anglo-English Attitudes and Working the Room, a selection from these two volumes titled, otherwise known as The Human Condition, was published in the United States in 2011. Uh, Jeff has also written uh, a book called The Missing of the Somme, which articulates a response to the memory of the Great War. And I think we'll kick off today with Jeff, and um, you know, Jeff could share with us, you know, what what got you to write that book? Sure. Well, thank you, Rana, and thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, I went to live in Paris to write um, uh, a novel, which was going to be a version of Scott Fitzgerald's book, um, Tender Is the Night. And there's a scene in that book when the character the main characters go to visit the battlefields of the Western Front, so, so, so I sort of, I, I did that. But in a way, that, that was the immediate impulse for going. But really, if you grow up in, in Britain, it's very different to, to uh, as Runner was describing it here in, in India. I mean, the First World War is, is everywhere. And so my, my sense of this is incredibly I mean, it's incredibly, my, my sense of the First World War is incredibly deep-seated and incredibly personal. I can remember so vividly, as an eight-year-old boy, we'd go around, I'd go around to my friend Gary Hunt's granddad's house. And almost every time we went there, he would drop his trousers and show us his shrapnel wounds from the First World War. And I mentioned this, so there was, an ab there was an absolutely living connection. I mean, I'm 55 years old. There's now no one alive in Britain who fought in the First World War. But when I was a kid, it wasn't just part of you know, history. It was really part of the lived fabric of, of everyday life. And I think the other thing I would say is, I mean, it, it, was, it was the First World War. It was a, it was a world war. It was, you know, it was happening all over the globe. But I think one of the strange things, and we can talk about this, uh, for a world war, it was extraordinarily local. And by that, I mean that whereas with the Second World War, we all have a sense of its, of its general narrative. You know, the fact that I'm British and know there was a Battle of Britain doesn't delude me into thinking that the Second World War was won over the skies of Britain. You know, everyone is familiar with the importance of Stalingrad, the Pacific War, all this kind of stuff. Whereas I would suggest that by contrast, each nation tends to remember the First World War. The First World War can be condensed down to one particular place. So at the risk of, I have this great fear of saying, saying something in which I'll be put right by Peter. You know, for Australia, it's, it's Gallipoli. For the French, it's Verdun. And for the British, it's the Somme. And I think one of the interesting things about this that the thing that each nation sort of celebrates in a way, celebrates, commemorates, also tends to be the single most calamitous event. So for France, it's the meat grinder of Verdun. For, for Britain, it's this, you know, this incredible catastrophe of 60,000 casualties on the first morning of, of the Battle of the Somme. So I think that's quite a significant thing about the, the sort of the way that this you know, this cataclysmic event lodges in our consciousness. And then just to both loop back to that initial visit I made to the battlefields of the Western Front and to tie it in with uh, India, I, I didn't really know where I was going to go. And then I came to this memorial in Tiapval where 
written with these huge, it was this memorial to the, uh, the 70,000 uh, British and Commonwealth troops who died in the course of the Battle of the Somme, whose bodies were never found. And all the way through my childhood, you know, I'd hear my grandfather talking about his experiences on the Somme. And there it was in huge letters, this, it, written on this memorial, the missing of the Somme. And there was such a sense of sort of convergence there. Anyway, that, is, that was the sort of main occasion for my writing the book. But also I think that's significant for this afternoon's discussion. Because I think it's, it's, one of the, it's a coincidence, but it's more than that, that that memorial, that incredible memorial, which was inaugurated in 1932, it was designed by Sir Edwin Lutyens, who, you hardly need me to tell you, also designed New Delhi, which was inaugurated just the year before in 1931. So I think there's this sort of extraordinary thing that goes on. Both of these things, you know, the war is, of course, an in many ways, it's an imperial war. New Delhi is intended as this great citadel of the, the kind of majesty of the, of the British Empire. And both of these two things, designed by Lutyens, become, in their different ways, memorials, I think. So that would be my opening, uh, those would be my opening thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, interesting you should mention Thiepval and uh, Lutyens. Uh, because uh, uh, I went to, to Thiepoir and Latians also designed uh, my school and um, uh, when I went there and you know I kind of felt oh my god the, the, the arches the red brick it's I, I, it was like being back in school the other interesting point I think with Jeff makes I mean he talks about the Somme and how that is central to British memory and Gallipoli is central to Australian memory uh, the, the interesting uh, thing is that in both of these battles, we had Indian troops present. Mm -hmm. uh, at the Somme, you still had the Indian cavalry division that took part in that battle. At Gallipoli, we had an entire Indian uh, infantry brigade and, a, and an artillery <coughs> brigade. Um, they have pretty much been written out of history. I'll come back to that a little later. Uh, move on to Maya. Maya, well, you have uh, um, uh, you know, something about uh, a question of whether it was an imperial war and how. Well, I would pick up on what Jeff said about the uh, significant locations for each belligerent nation as having been a great site of loss. One could add for India, of course, Kut in, in Mesopotamia, which was the site of uh, terrible siege and uh, surrender by a largely Indian, an entirely Indian army, uh, which has a resonant place uh, in, in the Indian military history of the war. The perspective that I come from on World War I is that of somebody who teaches the history of World War I in the United States. And in the United States, we have no location attached to World War I for the simple reason, I think, tying in with what Jeff has said, that we had nothing like the scale of loss that the other belligerent nations experienced in the war. The United States, of course, entered the war quite late in 1917. So 1914 is a date quite without resonance <laughs> in the United States. Uh, and our experience of the war was one that uh, has been so uh, neglected mm. that my job, in a sense, is to teach Americans why it matters. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is a, the, the, the world, the, the experience of World War I is a wonderful object lesson to me in the way that history looks different depending on where you mm -hmm. stand. It's an amazing illustration of that because the histories do look different from Britain, um, you see the Somme, from France and you see Tiepval and so on. Uh, Australia, you see Gallipoli. From the United States though, you see nothing. And I think that tells us something very important about the United States' self-presentation in the world. Uh, and yet, of course, it was the United States whose presence helped tip the balance mm -hmm. of troop support, obviously, and strongly in favor of the allied powers. And it was ultimately from the United States that the most uh, consequential vision for the post-war world took shape in the form of the 14 points of Woodrow Wilson, which laid out the principles of national self-determination, the framework for the League of Nations, and many of the principles that would go on to be 
uh, uh, sort of catalysts or, or contributors to the independence struggles that were beginning to take shape uh, in places such as India. So the United States' role in the conflict was pivotal. Its uh, uh, consequences for the uh, uh, aftermath of the war and ultimately the, the legacies of the war were foundational. And yet because we were not, as it were, a, a, a losing nation, a loser nation, we have absolutely no experience of this in our sort of national narratives or national history. Oh, thank you. Um, moving on to Peter. Peter is uh, incidentally working on uh, uh, a project on uh, the Indians at Gallipoli. And uh, he is, uh, we're closely working together as part of the larger India and the Great War project, which uh, um, I'm a member of uh, um, a team that's guiding this particular project. And uh, uh, Peter could perhaps tell us a little bit about what the war signifies for Australia in general, and then maybe move on to, uh, uh, you know, the the Gallipoli aspect in particular. Mm, yes, thanks, Rana, and uh, hello. The, um, I come from a country which is obsessed with the Great War, uh, and that's because the Great War is very closely associated with the, the formation of an Australian national identity. Um, I was saying about the, whether the war was an imperial war or a global war. I'd say that the war was experienced as an imperial war, but it's being remembered as a national experience. Mm. So Australians are looking back, especially to, as Jeff said, Gallipoli, and they're connecting Gallipoli with the idea of Australian nationhood. Mm. And nationhood has been, has been the central idea for Australia for the 20th century. And you can see the consciousness and the development of Australian nationhood happening through the 20th century, primarily through the agency of those two wars. But if you contrast Gallipoli, uh, sorry, contrast it for India, um, as Rana said, there were, there were Indian troops on Gallipoli, but the, the public memory of India almost uh, it has no connection with Gallipoli. So we need to ask ourselves what's going on here, and, and clearly the Indian troops who fought on Gallipoli, and indeed for the whole First World War, were not fighting for India, they were fighting of course for the empire, mm -hmm. and as India acquired a, a consciousness of nationhood, of course, that was the wrong cause. They'd effectively backed the wrong horse and they were relegated to obscurity because they served the Raj rather than the nation. Um, Rana's project is now, I think, to, to resurrect or to reinstate the idea of, of those people's experience uh, in popular memory in India today. And just to, to observe some paradoxes, I mean, one is that if you go to New Delhi and you walk down Rajpath, you see India Gate, and you see this, this enormous and powerful memorial to dead Indian soldiers. And it's a very popular place for people of Delhi to go. It's, it's one of the premier tourist sites for photographs and postcards. But people don't seem to associate uh, or to, to grasp the significance of that memorial. So I think one of Rana's uh, visions is that in five years' time, people will not just see India Gate as a, a, a location for a, a happy snap, but they'll see it as meaning something for India today. And, and the question is, what will that meaning be? Could I just say something? Yes, I, mean, I, I really don't want to interrupt, but I, um, in reference to what Peter was saying, I mean, I love going to these war memorials, and uh, if you get a chance to go to, if you're ever in Sydney, the Anzac Memorial, mm. I don't know if, you, I think it's a rather ugly memorial, actually, but the inscription is incredibly, incredibly moving and interesting in this context. The British memorials, nearly always there's a stone saying this was unveiled, you know, if it's an important one by... Her Majesty the Queen, or something like that, you know, some member of the royal family. The Anzac Memorial has these two great things. It says, this stone was laid by a soldier, and there's another stone that says, this stone was laid by a citizen. So I think in some lovely way you get, this is a memorial to the sort of, you know, let's put it like this, the sort of Republican freeing itself of imperial chains kind of thing. And then I wanted also just to pick up on something that Maya was saying. I think there's another reason why the First World War doesn't really exist in, has, hasn't really existed in American history. That's because you'd already had your calamity of the American Civil War. Mm. And one of the things that I was not conscious of when I wrote the book, but, I, but that I am now, that so many of these procedures of, of, of remembrance that I thought were instituted because of the you know, incomprehensible carnage of the First World War had actually been put in place. 
because of the incredible cataclysm of the American Civil War. So this thing of scrupulously identifying the dead, uh, building memorials to the missing, because of course the American Civil War is when a lot of, you know, so many people died from artillery, which means they, they sort of just disappeared. So yeah, I think that was there, was, there was an important precedent like that. The difference, of course, you know, as so famously articulated by Lincoln, is that unlike the First World War, which in retrospect we see now as just laying the, continue, the, the, the foundation for the, for the next war, that had an obvious, you know, it was a oh, war was worth fighting. Right. I would uh, pick up on your wonderful analogy between the Civil War and the Great War in America with reference to a location I know very well, which is Harvard Yard, mm -hmm. where I teach in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We have on the Harvard campus, in the yard, a church called Memorial Church. And if you stop any student and ask them what Memorial Church is a memorial to, they will probably not be able to tell you. We have another building nearby, Neo-Gothic Hall, which serves as a freshman dining hall, which is called Memorial Hall. If you stop any students on the campus and ask them what that is a memorial to, the chances are at least okay. I don't want to overprivilege the knowledge of Harvard undergraduates here, so you know, I'm not sure how many of them really know it, but more of them will be able to tell you what the memorial in Memorial Hall represents. What is the difference? Memorial Hall is a memorial to the Civil War. Uh -huh. Memorial Church mm -hmm. is a memorial to the Great War. Mm -hmm. And we have, again, sort of overwritten this, this memory. I think, too, the, res the, re the, the relation of the Civil War raises another interesting point about memory and World War I. Often, World War I has been seen as a, marking an incredible rupture from the 19th century world, a world of established hierarchies, of uh, entrenched privilege, uh, a world of certain kinds of formal uh, aesthetic uh, uh, artistic forms, uh, whereas World War I is seen as representing the great break to modernism, the mm -hmm. beginnings of you know, absolute mass democracy, of, of, of anti-colonial nationalism, and so on. And yet many of the forms of mourning that were adopted by the different nations who participated in World War I had a very sort of archaic, backward-looking quality to them. There's a real turn to religion, uh, which sort of flies in the face of the popular understanding of this as marking a great rupture. There's a sort of resurrection of certain kinds of uh, uh, poetic tropes and even occasionally aesthetic forms that draws on a kind of 19th century set of mm -hmm. traditions. So we can see a kind of continuity you know, in the rise of spiritualism and so on uh, in the memory of World War I with that earlier experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, thank you. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting. As far as India was concerned, um, you know, religion did play uh, a significant uh, part in, uh, in the conduct of the war itself. Uh, we had uh, a very significant proportion of Muslim troops and uh, of course the entry of uh, Turkey into the war, uh, the Sultan of Turkey was the, as a Khalifa was the nominal uh, head of, uh, spiritual head of Islam and that was played up uh, not just by pan-Islamists around the world but interestingly enough by Germany itself and uh, uh, the, the German uh, propaganda machinery was uh, working in uh, overdrive um, setting out rumors that the Kaiser himself had converted into uh, converted to Islam, uh, in, uh, Muslim prisoners of war in uh, uh, German POW camps were given uh, spe special indoctrinations. Uh, there was a, uh, a Kazi that used to go and you know indoctrinate them and uh, lead them in prayer and so on and so forth. Um, there's an interesting story of, uh, on that. Uh, there was uh, in uh, late 1914 or early 1915. Uh, one of the Indian regiments that was serving in uh, France uh, had a significant proportion of uh, uh, Afridi Patans. And uh, the Afridis have always had a, very precarious, uh, had a very precarious relationship in the British Indian Army. Uh, they, uh, a section of these men, about 14 of them, led by their VCO, um, uh, deserted to the Germans. And this man was uh, Jamedar uh, uh, Mir Must. And uh, the Germans made much of this. They fated them. They, uh, you know, presented them to the Kaiser. And the story goes that Mirmas was actually presented with uh, an iron cross. Uh, 
Um, and uh, uh, about three uh, months after that, uh, Mir Must's brother, who was still in the British Indian Army, mm. was presented with uh, the Victoria Cross by uh, mm -hmm. King George V mm -hmm. for uh, you know, holding up a, a, a German attack in the Second Battle of Ypres. Uh, the underlying insinuation behind this, of course, has always been that this was a political VC to counter the Iron Cross uh, awarded to his, uh, his brother. But the more interesting thing over here, and this is, uh, you know, how, that there was a, 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 uh, there was a very strong um, uh, underground political movement uh, originating from Berlin, whereby they were uh, encouraging not just the pan-Islamists, but also Indian revolutionaries. And uh, there was a provisional government of uh, uh, free India that was set up under a man called Raja Mahindra Pratap. And Raja Mahindra Pratap accompanied two uh, Prussian officers. It was called the Hentig Expedition that came through very surreptitious routes from Baghdad uh, all the way to Kabul. And from, in Kabul, they set up this provisional government. And the uh, intent was to try and encourage uh, and fo uh, foster, uh, foment rebellion against the British Raj in India. So. Uh, uh, now that was an interesting story in itself, but the other day when we were actually researching for uh, our project on India and the Great War, we came across uh, uh, the photo a a album of the Naidamaya Hente expedition. And over there in uh, uh, Baghdad, before setting out, uh, were these six uh, Muslim Indian troops in Turco German uniform, and they were named. And at one end of that uh, group, was standing Mir Must himself, you know, mm -hmm. so there he was deserted to the Germans in France and uh, standing there in this uh, German uniform in Baghdad before landing up in Kabul. So, uh, there, you know, it's, it's just interesting how, uh, how all these undercurrents were being played out. And as again, coming back to India and the war, it wasn't just, uh, 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 just the war effort, just in terms of men going abroad and fighting. The, uh, the First World War actually set the, uh, the, uh, the tone for the anti-colonial movement subsequently. When World War I broke out, uh, India, uh, I mean, almost uh, most of mainstream political opinion was in support of the war. And Indian support for the war astonished uh, the British no end because, you know, they, uh, took, they were taken aback by this uh, phenomenal display of loyalty. But the reason behind that at that point in time was, of course, that uh, Indian political opinion felt, or they were agitating at that point for mm -hmm. uh, home rule or dominion status. And they said, if we want a greater burden, uh, uh, a greater uh, 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 share of uh, uh, responsibility, we must be able to also share the burden of uh, imperial defense equally. So that, in effect, was, of course, a, a, a kind of how in, the war played out as far as India was concerned. But, yeah. Can I pick up on that story? Because the story you just told of Mir Mast and the, the uh, Afridi Batans suggests an explanation for why the Great War is not remembered across India as a whole. As you said, that the, the British Indian Army was drawn from particular places and particular peoples in British India, so particularly the Punjab and the Northwest. Um, but other parts of India had no men serving, although that widened in the course of the war. So when people from Odisha or Chennai or Kolkata come to India Gate, they don't see their names on that memorial. So that the, the experience of the Great War in India was, as, as Jeff said, was localized. That it's a, a tremendously powerful part of the, the, the undivided Punjab's experience and memory but it's completely irrelevant to other parts of India. And that's one of the obstacles you'll be overcoming, no doubt. Yeah, no, you're, you're right in that. And since the Indian Army was, of course, uh, uh, when the war broke out, was based on what the British called the martial races theory. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so that meant that there were only certain classes from certain uh, states and even certain districts within those states that uh, were recruited um, mm -hmm. into the Indian Army. Uh, that's not to say that they weren't recruited from other parts of the world. There is actually a village uh, down in, uh, uh, in Kerala that has a, a, a memorial to mm -hmm. over 300 men who went into the war. Uh, there are memorials in Chennai and other places, but um, uh, as uh, Peter rightly points out, they were 
the spread across the population was not as much as it was in uh, the north of India, and that was, mm -hmm. of course, the Punjab, um, uh, Rajasthan, uh, Garhwal, and certain areas in the United Provinces. Mm -hmm. But uh, you have to remember that in India, in the Indian Army, um, it was not a conscript army, it was a volunteer army. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I pointed out yesterday in uh, the session with Anthony Beaver, in World War II, um, the Indian Army was uh, uh, 2.5 million strong, and each man a volunteer. It was the largest volunteer force in the history of human conflict. But, um, and as it was in World War I. Although, in World War I, there's another story that isn't very widely known, and that is the contribution of uh, India in terms of uh, the labor forces that were the, so that was a non it was military labor but not soldiers they were they were part of the labor corps mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know they uh, that's a story that's that's not really been uh, uh, been told um, very widely there was an extensive Chinese labor corps and people know about that but uh, we very often miss out the fact that uh, there were nearly about 80,000 80, Indians who served in these uh, uh, labor corps in various theaters of war. I think perhaps we could, um, and it's a wonderful story that you were telling, it, among other things it makes me think about the continuities between World War I and World War II, where of course the experience of the Indian National Army is, is absolutely well known and central to the story of independence here. Mm -hmm. So some historians have argued that one can see World War I and World War II together as a long war, a very long war, yeah. uh, but the different pieces of it resonate differently. But I think what I was also struck by listening to, to what you said about, uh, about the uh, Fridi Patans is the way that all memories of, of the war that we've been discussing so far are memories of the military, the men in the trenches, the men on the ground. And yet it is the, the relatives, the survivors, the mm. civilians who mm. mark their loss. Mm. And it is also the civilians who in many ways carry the burdens of war. And, and you opened the session today by referring to the enormous financial contributions mm -hmm. that were made by India, by no means voluntarily. Yeah. Uh, and of course, that weighed extremely heavily on the average Indian uh, subject, as they were. So I think that it, it, it seems to me that if the India gate is to hold a, a wider resonance in India, uh, for, for all citizens of this nation. It's that aspect of the contribution to the war effort, the, the contribution to a war that is made by all of the people living in the belligerent nation, living uh, uh, on, the, on the home front of the war that needs to be folded into our narratives. But then there's such a difference, though, between the First World War and the Second World War in that respect. There's this nice phrase of, you know, for, for the British, the, the First World War means the Western Front. And, uh, you know, the great, now dead, uh, military historian John Keegan talks about the Western Front and saying, well, it was just a, a very thin ribbon of destruction running from, from Belgium down, down, down through France. And that's quite a, and of course, the, you know, as a result of the pressures on the economy, you get, un, you know, you get shortage rations, this sort of stuff. But crucially, you were only physically at risk if you were one of the, if you were in the, in the military, uh, you don't get that, uh, you know, that there's a crucial thing, apart from a few early kind of air age, you don't get this thing of total war whereby everybody, just by virtue of the fact that they're German, becomes, I mean, there's a certain amount of fussing around, of hedging, but really with, with uh, mass aerial bombing, that is when everybody is, is completely involved in, in, in the war, militarily as well. That's right. There are 70,000 British civilians who are killed in the Second World War as a result of bombing, of so bombing. it is much more yeah. broadly spread. Yeah. Um, just uh, carrying on from what Maya mentioned, there were, uh, the interesting thing is, you know, as part of this project, we were actually looking at uh, finding <coughs> Indian voices from the Great War, which is something which, incidentally, mm -hmm. Peter had a... Uh, uh, and a very interesting session just before we came over here mm. at the institution where, uh, where I work. Um, the Indian voices are well, sadly lacking by and large. One of the uh, major resources as far as um, uh, Indian troops are concerned is a, is a collection of censors, letters, which is available in the British Library. Um, and, but uh, apart from that, we also looked at 
um, at folklore, at, uh, at folk songs. Mm. And because in most, almost all our soldiers at that point in time came from rural backgrounds. And uh, it was a tradition in rural India that uh, the, the, uh, the, the exploits of brave men would be, um, uh, would be sung about. So there were bards that would compose these songs and they would sing them. But the interesting thing we found more about World War I is that uh, the, the, most of the poetry was, uh, or most of these songs or these compositions came from women. And it, there were women that were talking about longing, about desire, about separation. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, they wanted their men to come back. It wasn't so much about chest thumping and, you know, rah, rah, guys are fine. So it was very interesting. The other interesting thing, we came across this really, really interesting letter in, which had been written by Ajat Risalda to uh, uh, a paper which was started by Sir Choturam called the Jat Gazette. Uh, and he's writing this in, I think, 1917. And he says that this is a war which is, is a terrible war, but I wish that it, it does not end soon because for the first time, he says, our people, and he's talking about the Jats, and, you know, from the state of, present state of Haryana. He says, the first time that our people have actually been able to get out and see the world, the larger world, and how people in, in other countries live. And, uh, and in, in a sense, he said, it's, it's opened our eyes. And, and the more of our men that can get out and see that, it will uh, bring a greater change into mm -hmm. our own lives uh, from the places that we come from, which I found very, very interesting. But can, can I pick that up? Because the, the idea of Indian voices is central to the rediscovery and the reinterpretation of the Great War in India. Um, it seems to me that, that there are Indian stories out there, literally out there. As you say, that there are very few official uh, records which, which give Indians a, a voice. And the family in India is a very private thing. But I'm convinced that there must be many families in India who cherish stories that they've received from their forebears. And I don't just mean their great-grandfathers. I mean their, their, their female relatives as well. But they're partly hidden because nobody's ever asked them for it. Yeah. And if, if somebody could take up that, that, that burden and approach people and try and break through that veneer of privacy that families erect, and perhaps we might learn things about the experience of the Great War by Indians, of Indians, that we didn't know before. And, and to pick up a point that Maya made briefly, um, I'm going to plug a book here, but as you can't buy it in the shop, it doesn't matter. <laughs> the, um, the book that's, that's just about to land in my office in Canberra is called Lost Boys of Anzac. And it's about the, the very first Australians to die on the very first day of the landing on Gallipoli, 25th mm -hmm. of April, 1915. And there were exactly 101 of them. Not 100, unfortunately, but 101. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I've written a book about their experience before the war as soldiers, very briefly, and on the day they died, the day of the landing. But, the, but that bit of the book finishes halfway through. The second half of the book is all about their mothers and their fathers and their siblings and how they coped with the loss of their brothers and husbands on Gallipoli. And the thing is, that's how military history should be. It shouldn't just be about battlefields. And your project, I think, one of the wonderful things about it is, is that it is approaching the Indian experience of the Great War with a breadth of inclusion that has been missing from traditional studies mm -hmm. of the Great War, especially mm -hmm. in Britain and especially mm -hmm. in Australia. Mm -hmm. Well, I would, I would even amplify that by saying that histories of war need to be about much more than just the battles. Mm -hmm. They also need to be about the, the consequences and the mm -hmm. legacies. And mm -hmm. I think that if you were to survey uh, Indian uh, collective memory, family memory about this period, mm -hmm. you would come out with a lot of recollections of the beginnings of the independence struggle. Mm -hmm. Now, as we all know, memory is a very deceptive thing, mm -hmm. and often things are conflated or put out of order or, or exaggerated, or exaggerated mm -hmm. uh, as the case may be. But I think that the experience of the war in the longer uh, Indian imagination and that of many other nations, such as Australia, as you've mm -hmm. mentioned, is folded up with what happened afterwards. Mm -hmm. And the fact of, of the Great War as having been really the, the sort of opening of the gates, in a sense, for widespread anti-colonial struggles uh, uh, around the world uh, is very significant, even as the war, of course, reinforced the place of the European mm -hmm. empires, yeah. most notably in the Middle East. Mm.
Yeah, thank you. We, we're coming to the end, and uh, some, they're signaling that it's time for a Q&A. Says, anybody has any last words? Mm, no. I want to hear from them. All right. So we can uh, look. Um, the, that gentleman, I think he's been raising his hand for a long time. The gentleman who's standing up, and then we can. Uh, a very brief question. Everybody has to answer. Hello. Do you think the Second World War will continue to, to enjoy the status of being the last World War for all times to come? I hope if so. not, yeah. If not, then when will be third one be there? <laughs> and why who will reach it and when? And will we this audience live long enough to see it? We're historians, not soothsayers, I'm afraid, sir. <laughs> <laughs> but no, go on. Oh yeah. Uh, well yes sir, sir, certainly we hope that uh, you know uh, uh, we hope it doesn't happen. Yes, absolutely. But the gap between first and second was very short. It, it since, was. And since second it is quite a long enough. It, well, I mean, as far as the First World War was concerned, uh, as historians and, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, um, we can pretty much look back and, and say that uh, World War II was in the making. But luckily, I think uh, events have we moved far enough in time to say that there is a break as far as World War II is concerned. And that if and when and hopefully never, well, yeah, we pray that it doesn't, but I don't think there will be a link to. The gentleman in, in the front row, he, he's, uh, um, he obviously came early enough, so I think he needs to, <laughs> deserves a prize, so. <laughs> Thank you. Something of both Rana, you and Peter mentioned, but didn't elaborate, is 1990, First World War is not remembered. We enthous enthusiastically embraced it. We believed that this was a war for liberty. Mm. Yes. And when 1919 comes, and the reforms of 1919 let India down, as they let China down, mm. down. Yeah. obviously then that involvement of yours is yeah. no more your involvement. Yes. Well, the personal histories are very important. Yes. As a nation, it would be very difficult to accept that as uh, the kind of Gallipoli did for you, mm. or the guy Somme did for England, yeah. would never really resonate very easily in the Indian. Uh, well, uh, I mean, the, you have a point over there, sir, the, uh, but at the same time, you know, I think that our, uh, the, that history as uh, what, uh, most of us in this country, uh, our citizens, we understand it is, of course, the, the central narrative of our history is, is the freedom struggle. Mm. And uh, everything else uh, becomes peripheral. Uh, but uh, my, uh, my submission in that is that even with, if you look at the, the, uh, the history of the freedom struggle, both the First and the Second World War uh, played a very, very significant role. Mm -hmm. And that, that role in itself, uh, for whatever uh, it was worth, is, even that is negated, primarily because uh, you know, the, uh, the, the constructed narrative looks upon it and says, I mean, that was a colonial um, uh, fight, uh, it wasn't our, our thing. If, but, yeah, it is. If of I could just add one point on that, I think, you know, on this subject of how the, the consequences of the war, of course, strengthened anti colonial nationalism, even as they fortified empire. What you really see in the aftermath of, of the Great War so vividly, of course, at Amritsar is the intensification of violence. Mm. And mm -hmm. the fact that you have all of these demobilized soldiers, that you have a huge amount of weapons mm -hmm. in circulation, mm -hmm. that you have new military technologies that are being brought to bear, mm -hmm. I think is, is hugely important. The first major aerial campaigns against civilians are mm -hmm. perpetrated uh, in, by the uh, British, in the Middle East in, mm -hmm. in what is now Iraq. Mm -hmm. So you can see here the ways in which those two sides of the, of the legacy come together. Can I just say briefly, I'm glad you mentioned Amritsa, because it's, I read in the new history of the Punjab by the author Gandhi, uh, the possibility that among the victims of the Jallian Wallabag massacre were just demobilized soldiers. Mm. And I'd love to know if any of those soldiers, if any of those victims were ex-soldiers, because it points to the disillusionment that you mentioned about the Great War in India. Uh. I wanted to add about uh, the Singapore mutiny thing. Mm. So you mentioned about the legend role and you mentioned about uh, how memory is not served in, in context of India. Mm. 
but in singapore mutiny what happened was uh, there were muslim regiment they mutinied uh, they rebelled and they seized singapore for 3 days and then it was quelled 41 people were publicly executed they all were from haryana mm. and they all were from muslim uh, muslims and afterwards they they their families moved to pakistan so there is no memory of them in indian history books not in pakistani history books and also the scale of people going to war was like 400 people per village and from them if 10 people rebelled then who i think it didn't matter for history people to focus on that i think that should be as voices from women as voices from other things mm. it would need should be i think added also no, yes can uh, i yes yeah, oh, certainly please oh, oh thanks no, uh, can i say that, that you've mentioned the, the mutiny of the fifth light infantry in singapore that's why you need military social historians because the curious thing about that and i i, I you're right with your analysis of the causes of that mutiny but the military social historians would point to um the dynamics within that regiment to explain that protest mm. and the other thing about it is is that the the men who weren't prosecuted for mutiny volunteered to go and fight the war so it's a much more complex position than a simple these men are uh, protesting against british imperialism would have us believe but again i agree it needs to be reexamined and i would especially hope to get some oral history from, if somebody could do it thank you so the lady in red uh, no in front of you here behind you rather now there yeah Hi. Um I hope this isn't a dumb question, but why were only certain um castes allowed to participate in in the fighting? Oh, okay. I mean that's no it's not a dumb question, but it's it's fairly easily answered as I said. Uh at that point in time, uh, the uh the prevalent uh theory as far as the British were concerned, mm. and this had more to do with uh, how they viewed themselves than it had to do with anything else, was they said that there were certain uh classes in india that were more martial than the others mm -hmm. and um so uh, they restricted um uh, recruitment into the army only from uh, some of these classes and that this particular theory of course came in uh, post 1857 which was the great uh, i mean the, the, the first uh, uprising or uh, they call it the mutiny and the nationalist historians call it the first war of indep independence but it all boils down to that mm -hmm. so yeah so i have a view which is totally on yeah. the, on a opposite spectrum of the discourse sure. for any historical value we need to have we, we need to see in the perspective whether they have ideals and what morals they stood for at the point of time in the era the project you are working on of resurrecting the world war 1 foot soldiers actually were basically paid soldiers working for themselves they had no ideals and no vision they were just going away from poverty and try to reinterpret them in the current context i think is wrong mm. please please elaborate um yeah well thank you uh, uh we're not reinterpreting them so we are, we are uh, resurrecting um, a memory of a conflict that uh, that had a profound impact on the history of this uh, uh, this country it it impacted us in many ways uh, the stories of the soldiers are just one segment of that and we don't uh, we don't mean to um, we're not imbuing them with an ideal or with uh, uh, you know with with anything other than what they were and i know that for a fact um, uh, my uh, my grandfather served in the war his brother served in the war uh, so and almost every one of my father's uh, father's generation that my uh, they were all their fathers were were soldiers and they all served in world war 1 not a single one of my dad's generation went into the army they all became socialists because mm -hmm. by that time they uh, you know the the split with Uh, the raj as far as certain segments in uh, mm. the punjab was concerned was complete so they were going to fight against the british not for them but uh, so so the the all that we are trying to do is we the whole world is now looking at this event and the, why they're looking at it bec is because it was a very important event around the world and we just want to see how 
how it was important for us. Uh, that's all. Can I say thank you for the criticism, but I, I don't agree. Hmm. Uh, I don't think you're right to say they didn't fight for anything. I think what they fought for was values that you don't share. Uh, they fought for king and empire, and also the idea of duty and loyalty to their regiment, to their comrades, to the Raj. Now, you and I may not share those values, but I think as people interested in the past, we have to understand people and their motives, even though they're different. So the people that Jeff wrote about in The Missing of the Somme, they all trooped off to war in 1914 thinking that they'd fight for liberty of the Belgians and king and empire, and we now know that that was folly. They were, they were perhaps duped, perhaps they were wrong, but you wrote a book about them, and you sympathize profoundly with people that you don't necessarily agree with. And I think that's what we have to do about the men that, that, that we're writing about. But I'm happy to disagree. Excuse me. Sorry. I'd like to ask a question as to why did North India not manage to produce um, a novelist or a writer or a poet of the caliber who fought in World War I, like Secret Assassin, or Eric Maria Remarque, or even Ernst Junger? Why did we not come up with our literature back then? Mm. Well, sir, the, uh, we did have somebody who wrote about uh, a good novelist, actually. I was Mulkraj Anand. He, he wrote a book uh, called Across the Black Waters mm -hmm. uh, on uh, the First World War, which was based on his uncle's experiences in France. Um, the, uh, I suspect one of the reasons, you see, as far as other countries were concerned, they were, a lot, they were conscript armies. So there were a lot of gentlemen rankers. There were people with, with very good uh, education. But uh, our armies or our soldiers were essentially came from a rural background. Now, the interesting thing is there was one segment of Indian population, and that was from Bengal, that mm. was petitioning uh, the British to be a part of this war effort. And uh, there were about uh, 1.5 million Indians who took part in the war. Not one of them wrote a book. There were about 1,500 Bengalis who took part, and three of them wrote books. <laughs> so uh, now, you know, so there you are. It's here for Bengal. Take one question from yeah, the right. front. Yeah, sure. A woman. Yes. A woman. The young. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> My question is addressed to all the panelists, just because I'm fascinated with history. It's just, uh, I would like to know what your take would be on uh, the hypothesis that Japan. Uh, since we're talking about the impact and we're talking about the era where colonialism was uh, fought against, uh, the World War I era. So what do you think would be the impact if, uh, like, would Japan have the potential to be a superpower today uh, if it weren't for uh, World War I the way things happened? I mean, given the fact that it was the only Asian country which was not technically colonized at all at the time. Thank you. And Thailand. <laughs> well then, <laughs> you can answer the question, Maya. Well, so <laughs> now I'm on the spot. Um, so, well, I mean, I think this is a fascinating question, and I would like to stress here the value of the counterfactual uh, in assessing history, because, you know, we tend to get these tunnel visions of what happened and try to explain why what happened happened, but we also need to explain why what didn't happen didn't happen. <laughs> Uh, so I thank you for your question. Uh, and I, I would just say to that that one of the, uh, you know, we, we look at World War I uh, often now in the context of nationalism, one way or another. But I would again like to reassert this question of imperialism and point out that in the era leading up to World War I, you have a fundamental uh, shift in the balance of imperial, uh, or in the balance of sort of economic power and industrial power in the world. Germany, Japan, the United States, of course, emerging. And yet, because they don't have the territorial empires that mm. Britain, France, and so on do have, you see a kind of collision course being set. So I think, you know, it's a, it's a very valuable question to ask. We could throw in there questions about Russia and China, each of which, mm. of course, have their uh, democratizing revolutions in this same period. Uh, and I think that there was clearly a sort of shift in global power toward new sort of industrial and political centers in Asia that was uh, plainly uh, thrown off course in various ways by the uh, assertions uh, of World War I. Yes, look, I think it's a really good question because as Maya mentioned earlier, one of the great um, engines of the legacy of the Great War was the Versailles Conference. And at the Versailles so-called peace conference, 
uh, not just the big powers, but the, the British dominions and the smaller nations, including Japan, came to make their case. And Japan was mightily affronted by the Australian opposition to Japan's desire for a place at the peace conference and for a, an equitable um, share of the spoils. Now, it's probably too strong an emphasis, but the, uh, the Australian Prime Minister uh, literally uh, refused to deal with the Japanese and, and you know, said that he wouldn't deal with an Asian power. In fact, he wanted Australia to develop the, uh, an empire in the Far East as a bulwark mm -hmm. against the Japanese. Now, if Hughes hadn't been so determinedly opposed to the Japanese, might that have made the Japanese better disposed towards the West in the uh -huh. years between the wars? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it was the most important factor, but you just put your finger on the fact that the Great War had profound consequences, which those at the time had no idea about. So thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. I think uh, we've reached the end of our session. Just mm. remains for me to thank our panelists. Well thank you, Jeff, Maya, Peter. Great. Thank you very much. It was really educative, very informative session. Thank you so very much, Jeff, Peter.